perform endoscopic spine surgery. We're broadcasting the surgery live as we do all of our surgeries every week from beginning to end unedited. This way the viewers like yourself can watch the surgery and see everything that happens. If things go well, you see how it goes well. If we have issues that come up, we deal with them. You see how we deal with them. The purpose of this broadcast is educational. It's free and it's open to the public. Um, the, really our goal here is to let people know about the more recent advances in spine care, whether it's surgery or therapy or medications or shots, whatever that treatment is, we take questions throughout the surgery and do our best to answer them. So we're here to educate the public about what's going on. Now, this patient has um, some degenerative disc disease in her cervical spine at multiple levels, C4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, and there's herniations at multiple levels. But the herniation that I believe is causing most of her symptoms is the C5, 6. And she wanted to have one disc fixed only, and that's the one that I think is the most symptomatic. So. We're going to be performing a surgery that is new and um, it has been peer reviewed and published. It's FDA approved completely. We've been doing this surgery for 15 years at Duke Spine Institute. It's endoscopic sur surgery of the spine. And we do cervical, we do thoracic, and we do lumbar. Lumbar is far more common for back pain, but people with herniated discs in the neck or degenerative disc disease in the neck, in the cervical spine, they can have this done. The whole surgery will be done with a four millimeter incision. All right, we're gonna get started. Our patient is asleep, laying on her back, intubated. My first step is to feel the spine and to uh, create a safe path to the spine. Shot. Remember, we're going to C5, 6. So two, three, four, five, six. It looks pretty good there. Let me just check it again, Shot. Well, why are, you so, why are we so overexposed? Shot. All right, AP quick. So on the lateral view, we're, we're at the five, six level. So two, three, four, five, six, we're using an X-ray, but I wanna see what the AP view shows a little bit to her right. So I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna reposition. Shot, that's good. Now go back to a lateral. So we're at the five, six level in the middle and we're going to enter the disc from the front shot shot AP I just want to get one more AP to make sure I'm in the middle. And everybody agrees, two, three, four, five, six. You can see a bone spur in the front at four, five, but that's not what we're here for. It looks good. All right, lateral. So we're, we're good on the AP view, which is the front to back view. Our needle is right where I want it to be in the middle of the spine in the front. And on the lateral view, we're looking good. So I can take my fingers off, keep the needle there, and I can advance the needle into the disc. Shot. That's where we are. All right, shot. Good. Okay, so this is how this advanced technology starts with a needle access to the disc. Take a shot. And if, what is that thing there, that wire up at C2, C1, C2? That's one of your monitor wires, doctor? Yeah, it's gotta be. Oh, is it one of ours? It's not one of ours, is it? All right. Just see if you can figure it out. All right, good. All right, so our patient uh, blood pressure is good. Let's try to keep it a little bit lower. I like to keep the systolic around 100 to, uh, basically from 90 to 110. And right now we're at about 125, which is normal, but I like to have it a little bit lower. My patient is completely chemically paralyzed, meaning we've used a muscle relaxer to put her 
to make her muscles relax. That way I can feel the spine through the front without the uh, muscles around the trachea and esophagus contracting. Now I went right between two muscles in the front of the spine called the longus coli muscles. And if my fingers represent the longus coli muscles, there's a left and a right longus coli muscle. And go ahead and put uh, something between my fingers, the dilator. So we went basically right into the spine, into the disc between those two muscles. You see that, Zach? Yeah. Now, if the needle goes into the longus coli muscle, you're going to get a little bit of bleeding, and you're also going to possibly hit the sympathetic trunk that's in there. And then you can get a Horner syndrome. So you want to avoid the longus coli muscles. You want to go down the middle. Our needle's in great place, great position. We're going to do our discogram now. This is not an evocative discogram. The patient's asleep. They can't tell us if they're having pain. This is what we call a chromo, chromo discogram. And with a chromo discogram, we're just staining the nucleus and we're looking for the annular tear. Can you see the annular tear in the back of the disc? That's where her neck pain's coming from is the annular tear. You want to show us with the arrow where the annular tear is, Jordan? There it is. This little black line right back there. So all disc herniations start from an annular tear. An annular tear is a tear in the annulus fibrosis. It can happen in the front of the disc, the back of the disc, or the sides. The only painful annular tears are ones on the side, in the back, I mean, not the side or the front. Show me a shot. When I look up, it means take a shot. We just put the guide wire in. So her disc is pretty collapsed, and that's fine. That's not what we're here to, to fix is a collapsed disc. We're here to basically get the pressure off the nerve going down her right arm and to treat her neck pain. So right now I can see the guide wire is sticking out. And that's good. Shot. Now I'm going to remove the um, needle and leave the guide wire. And the guide wire serves as a guide. Okay. It's kind of like if you go travel somewhere and you need to find your way around you get a guide. A guide will show you where to go and what not, where not to go. Okay? So it's important. Guides take you to the best way, the best route, if you have a good guide, and this is a good guide wire, they take you the best way to get somewhere, from point A to point B, from one place to another, from the start to the destination. Okay? Is there epi in there? So guide wire is very, very important. It has to be placed properly. If you do it properly with good technique, then you don't need to worry about damaging things like the carotid artery, the esophagus, the trachea, or the jugular vein, or the sympathetic uh, trunk, or I'm sorry, or the vagus nerve. So any of those things, okay? And to place the guide wire properly, you have to have reliable information you know, reliable landmarks, okay? Every guide uses landmarks and knowledge and experience. And so this is no different in spine surgery when you're doing minimally invasive endoscopic surgery. We need landmarks. And the landmarks I use during the fluoro is the um, spinal anatomy, the vertebrae, the discs on AP view and lateral view. So we're making a four millimeter incision. You see that, Zach? You want to zoom in on that? I've just made a four millimeter incision. And that, you imagine that's going to heal really well. Now think about what would an ACDF look like? You know, an ACDF is the alternative surgery. That's a cervical fusion. That's what every other spine surgeon recommends in the world. And I used to do them all the time. I've done over a thousand ACDFs. I've stopped doing them to do these laser surgeries because the laser is much better. All right, Zach, why don't you run a video for our audience to show them how a herniated disc can cause neck pain and arm symptoms. Meanwhile, we're going to place our dilator. Are you running the video? It's running now. Good. Traumatic injury on the disc can cause annular tears to form.
Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissue develops within the annular tear causing neck pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause worsening symptoms. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to the nearby nerve roots, causing arm pain. Pain signals travel up the nerves to the brain, causing localized neck pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of neck pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc in neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. So we've placed our dilator through the skin incision. It's down on the spine. Uh, you can see it on the lateral view. We're about to enter the disc. I already checked the AP view to make sure that we're in the middle of the spine, and it is. So I'm kind of twisting the dilator to get it to enter the C5-6 disc from the front. Now the front of the disc is not where the problem is. It's in the back of the disc. And that's where we're headed, is the back of the disc. The beauty of the surgery is that we're going to leave the rest of her disc alone. We're not going to take it out. Now she's already lost a lot of the disc because she has an annular tear with inflammation and she's had it for years and it's been untreated. So that annular tear has basically, um, can you stabilize her neck please? Grab her head, put her in neutral alignment and a little bit of inline traction. So I'm gonna have my anesthesiologist just stabilize the head because every time I push down, the spine flexes a little bit. I don't want her flexing, keep her in slight extension, okay? You got her? Mallet. So I'm right inside the disc and we're gonna enter it, shot. Yep. I'm gonna aim for the back. Okay, you can relax now, shot. <clears throat> Thank you, doctor. Shot. Now we're headed right to the back of the disc where the herniation is. There's a little bit of osteophyte too. So we've got our dilator to the back of the C5-6 disc. You can see the number two bone at the top of the spine. And then it goes to the number three, then four, then five, then six. And again, we're only treating C5-6 today. So I've got my dilator through the disc, not damaging the disc at all. And now we're at the base of the herniation at the back of the disc. I'm gonna bring, let me just show you the tube. We're gonna do the entire surgery through this tube right here. It's a four millimeter tube. So think about ACDF surgery. ACDF surgery, there's a big slit on the neck. Patients have trouble swallowing afterwards. They have hoarseness. Many times it's permanent from the scar tissue and the damage that's done during the surgery by the surgeon. And then you got a metal plate in your neck bolted to your spine. That metal plate is always gonna be pushing on your swallowing tube from the back. So some of those swallowing problems are related to scarring of the swallowing tube, the back of the swallowing tube to the front of the plate, which is sitting on the front of the spine. So you wanna get away from metal plates, you wanna get away from fusion. Fusion means you're losing natural movement. With this surgery, the Duke Laser Disc Repair, there is no loss of movement. You preserve your movement. Sean, now I'm gonna advance the, the tube. I've gotta make sure that the dilator doesn't go in, in any further than it is. It can go in a few more millimeters, but I've got a little safe buffer zone. But you can see I'm advancing the tube into the disc. This procedure you're watching is performed at the Duke Spine Institute exclusively here in or near Orlando, Florida. And we have people who travel from all over the world to have this type of surgery done. Someday endoscopic surgery like this will be done all over the world 
but right now this particular procedure is done here. Shot. Now because the disc space is collapsed uh, from degenerative disc disease, and again the reason is when you have an annular tear and a herniation, get it fixed right away. If you don't, the disc will keep collapsing over time. People don't know why we have degenerative disc disease, but we do. We figured it out at Duke Spine Institute. It's actually from the annular tear and inflammation inside the annular tear that's ongoing because the annular tear is untreated. Duke's, Duke laser disc repair, what you're watching right now, is the only surgery in the world that actually does a debridement of the annular tear. All right, that's as far as I can get it right now. We're going to start removing the herniation and we're going to advance the tube a little bit more as we go along. Um, let's see, shot. So once again, we have to use the x-ray machine. Do you have a way to remove it? Uh, we have to use the x-ray machine to, uh, to guide ourselves here because we're using metal instruments so we can see it on the x-ray. Yeah. Yep, keep going. So the dilator has been removed. Just so you can all see what it looks like. It's this basically a three millimeter uh, cylinder that has a tapered tip, okay? Now we're only doing one level today. Um, a lot of times we're doing two or three levels, but this patient is a one level. Zach, why don't you run the video showing the Duke laser disc repair animation so people can understand what we're about to do. Can you, are you gonna do that, Zach? Yeah, just one second. All right, let me have a scope, please. Take your time. Disc herniations have are a common cause of chronic neck pain. The inflamed annular tear causes neck pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes arm pain. a Band-Aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. It can take up to 12 months. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. So you uh, were able to learn a little bit watching the animation video, but basically we're going to be using a laser to remove the herniated disc in the back of this disc, C5-6. So this is a C5-6 disc herniation. There's some calcification of the disc. And we're going basically to leave the entire C5 disc alone except for the little herniation in the back we're going to remove with the laser. And we're going to debride the annular tear so that it'll heal properly. The annular tear has been trying to heal in this patient's disc for years and years and years and the reason it has not been able to heal is that the herniated nucleus propulsus is wedged in between the torn edges of the annulus and it's preventing that healing from occurring and it's causing inflammation to set in and stay there for years and years and that inflammation has basically destroyed the disc so degenerative disc disease is a result of annular tear and herniation which are traumatic events all right um, we're going to bring our endoscope in. You can see the laser fiber here, right, Zach? We can see it. The endoscope is this long tube, and that's where we work through is that endoscope. We have irrigation. We have a light source, which is the blue. We have a camera, and we have an endoscope. This is endoscopic spine surgery. It's called full endoscopic. Now, there's a lot of surgeons out there scamming people saying they do endoscopic surgery when they really don't. Um, there's a lot of people saying they do laser surgery when they really don't. But this is endoscopic laser surgery, and Duke Spine Institute is a world leader in endoscopic laser surgery. 
All right, so we've got the laser fiber at 12 o'clock. I'm going to bring the pedal in. We're at 20, right? 20 Yes, sir. All right, so there's a space between the vert vertebral end plates. Here's part of the herniation. Why do I not have good flow? Did you find the pumps yet, Luis? You have to get them in now. They're arthroscopic pumps. Just getting a lot of bubbles. I don't know why. Just could be bubbles in the line. I don't know. I mean, there is cavitation, obviously. Cavitation is, a, there's a herniation right there. You see that piece of herniation that just came out? We're going to float it out. So what we're doing in this surgery is removing the herniated fragments of disc, the nucleus, and that stains blue. And look how collagenized it is. It's scarred up. And we're debriding the annular tear. Don't pop a bag. There's a bone spur right there, that golden colored thing. Another herniated fragments coming out. And I just float them out the tube, all right? So back down here is where the herniation is. And it's uh, pretty, pretty um, grungy in terms of arthritis creates a reaction in the, in the bone and in the ligaments and in the tendons and in the capsule. Basically, the body's response to chronic inflammation is to form this abnormal tissue. And this abnormal tissue can press on nerves and it can be very painful. So that's what we're here to remove is this abnormal tissue disc. We're not going to be implanting anything. We're not going to be fusing bones together. This is a natural repair of a herniated disc and it's the least invasive of all surgeries. It has the very best outcomes. Better than ACDF, better than artificial disc. Okay? And the reason it does is Yeah, but this surgery typically gets rid of 90% if you treat all the discs that need to be treated. Now, not every patient wants to treat all the discs. They want to treat just a few, maybe one in this case. And like I said, this patient in particular has more than one abnormal disc, but we're just treating the one disc, the one that we believe is causing most of her symptoms. Not every disc needs to be treated. Not every disc herniation needs to be treated. For many people, disc herniations don't cause symptoms. So we have to try to figure out which ones are causing symptoms and which ones are not.
She's still relaxed. How long after the surgery can they, till they can get a, their hair done? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, can they keep their collar on while they're getting their hair done? I guess that's the question. Do they have to do that? Yeah. Okay. I, would, I would like them to keep their collar on. You know, the collar is worn for six weeks, so I think as long as they're wearing their collar, it's fine. This is all uh, bone spur. I'm trying to get as much of the disc herniation out as I can. Take a look at the other side. Zach, any questions from our audience so far? Not yet. And because you can see the bleeding is coming from the end plates where the bone is. Um, and this is common when you have degenerative disc disease that's really bad, like this patient's, where um, the inflammation has basically scarred the end plates together. And we're not here to fix the end plates or the uh, inflammation in the end plates. We're here to fix the... Uh, the foramen basically and get rid of the herniation that was in there and it looks like we've gotten the herniation out I'm not getting any more so we're pretty much done and she's only a one level so what oh let me see I don't think so though because the, the pieces came out here. You may find them on the... Yeah. We do have a question now. Sure. Uh, we have a viewer asking, uh, how old is this patient's neck injury? I'm sorry, Zach. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, the volume is very low. I, can't, I couldn't hear your question. They're asking, uh, how old is this patient's neck injury? Oh, yeah, really good question. Um, you know, she's saying 15 years, but I think it's a lot older than that. Um, so it's really important because for, a year, for forever, we've never understood what causes degenerative disc disease, but now we do. And the cause of the degenerative disc disease is the annular tear. And when you get an annular tear in your disc, it's uh, the very beginning of this condition. And what happens is the annular tear allows the nuclear jelly to come out into the annular tear. And once the jelly gets into the outer half of the annular tear, it starts inflammation. And once the inflammation starts, that's when the pain starts. And that's when the neck pain and the headaches and the arm symptoms really start, okay? So let me have the tube. And once the inflammation starts, uh, inflammation is a destructive process. Inflammation destroys, okay? Maybe people don't know that, but think about it this way. Um, 
if you if you you you've all seen on on youtube and television buildings that get demolished right so they could build new ones that's really what's going on when you have a damage to the back of your disc your body responds to that by damaging it even more destroying it like cleaning it out liquefying it breaking it down through inflammation and it's your inflammatory system that does that and then once everything has been cleared out then um, you know the macrophages come in they're cells that actually gobble up all the debris so they're kind of like the excavators and the bulldozers and the cranes and the dump trucks that remove all the debris okay so the polymorphonucleosides are a type of inflammatory cell pmns and they bring the enzymes in the proteases lipases sucrases they basically break down everything during inflammation and when you injure your, a part of your body, the inflammation comes in for about a week. And by the end of the week, the macrophages are removing all the debris, okay? And the inflammation, it burns out, it's done by two weeks, and your body's healing at that point, bringing in fibroblasts and blood vessels and new nerves, and it's healing and repairing. The problem with a herniated disc that has uh, chronic inflammation like hers that lead to degenerative disc disease is that the inflammatory phase that takes a week normally never stops. It just never stops. And the reason it never stops is because the nucleus propulsus is the cause of the inflammation and there's too much of it there for a little bit of inflammation to get rid of. The nucleus propulsus is the herniation. And so it gets stuck in the annular fibers where the tear is and it just promotes endless inflammation and so the repair phase never never comes the destructive phase just keeps going and the disc gets destroyed over time over years with chronic inflammation so that's what we're dealing with oh let me show you the incision the incision is there can you see that zach right we there. can see it it's a tiny incision and the whole surgery is done through this little metal straw all right you guys a little pressure and we're done so because her disc was completely destroyed and just a little bit in the back was where the herniation was, that's what we got out. It really came out mostly in the beginning. And, um, and like I said, in her case, she's got several degenerated discs, but we're only fixing the one today. Um, yeah, so she's going to wake up and go home in about an hour. That's one of the reasons the surgery is so amazing. There's no fusion, no metal, no artificial disc needed. I'm throwing this one leaded glove away. No complications. Our blood loss was one mil. This was a DLDR. Left approach. C56. All right, if you have questions, type them up for me and I'll come answer them for you, okay? Other than, otherwise, we've got a single level lumbar coming up next, L5S1. A patient with back pain and leg pain. Yeah. I feel, I really feel great, I mean. Uh, it's a herniated disc well, in the Well, before the operation, I can only walk up pushing on the nerve root, maybe 100 feet. I had to go back in the house. Now I can walk pretty much two miles every morning. In fact, they marvel at me at the gym that I'm able to do what I can do there. I'm kind of an inspiration for a lot of people at the gym. <laughs>My name is Greg Spadaro. Um, this is my father, Jack Spadaro. We are from Connecticut. We moved down here for me. It's Duke Laser Disc Repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke Laser Disc Repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke Laser Disc Repair.
The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home enjoying life with a very fast recovery allowing normal activities without pain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke laser disc repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke laser disc repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke laser disc repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke laser disc repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke Laser Disc Repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke Laser Disc Repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery 
and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. Whereas the recovery from Duke laser disc repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement. Whereas there is no fusion with the Duke laser disc repair, normal movements of the joints in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke laser disc repair. In fact, most Duke laser disc repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke laser disc repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke laser disc repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. And there are just a handful of surgeons in the world that know how to do anterior cervical surgery, transdiscal endoscopic. And most of them are in Asia, in Korea, uh, maybe in China. But most of them keep the patients awake uh, during the surgery, which I don't do. I put patients to sleep, and that way I think it's safer for the patient. We don't have complications. Um, the Asians and Koreans have had complications, they've paralyzed patients, and they've pretty much stopped doing a lot of the anterior cervical endoscopic transdiscal surgery. Uh, I have peer-reviewed and published my work um, in the National Library of Medicine in the United States, Surgical Neurology International. Back in 2012, almost 10 years ago, our surgeries are safe and effective at treating degenerative disc disease, annular tears, herniated disc, bulging discs. The whole spectrum of this disease basically from beginning to end. Uh, so we have a question from the audience. What's the question, Zach? Uh, does a herniated disc bulge ever go away if untreated after an epidural steroid injection? So someone is asking does a, a disc bulge or herniation ever go away if un, untreated, not surgically treated, but treated with a steroid injection? The answer is no. The disc bulges and herniations don't go away um, unless you treat them surgically. But what they do do is they become asymptomatic. So um, let's take a look at this disc here, all right? A normal disc has a jelly center called the nucleus propulsus and then an annulus fibrosus holding the jelly in place. And this is really tough and strong. When you get a tear in the annulus fibrosus, the jelly can get pushed out through the tear, if you squeeze down on the disc, which you do when you bend and twist and lift things, and it pushes out some of the jelly and you get a little lump there. So it's kind of erupted out like a, a little volcano. That's a disc herniation or disc bulge. Those don't go away. Your, your MRI will not really change much uh, over time unless you actually have it surgically fixed. But what does happen is those disc herniations can heal themselves and not be painful. So Typically, when you injure the disc, you get a tear and a herniation, you get some pain. I've had one myself, and the pain lasted just for a few hours, and then my body healed it, okay? And I haven't had pain, but maybe every 10 years, I'll get a little day of pain, you know? And that's most people. Most people's bodies can heal the disc herniation, wall it off with scar tissue, so there's no more inflammation going on. 
but for some reason there's about five to ten percent of people with herniated discs they just cannot for some reason um, heal that disc uh, herniation and they keep getting pain and it may start out as episodic where they get it once in a while maybe once every few months it flares up and then it gets more frequently and to the point where they're getting pain constantly in their back or neck and then it starts going down the arm so they get that radiculitis or radiculopathy along with it so what I found is that herniations don't heal themselves ever but they do get better in terms of the symptoms and that's what you hope for with the epidural you're hoping that that steroid injection will reduce the inflammation on the surface of the disc that it's in contact with and that that will ease up some of the pain that people feel and that works a lot of times but unfortunately many times it's temporary because it's only a matter of time before the person like re-injures the disc again once you get a tear in the annulus it bursts open and the jelly starts coming out that never goes back to hundred percent strong ever I mean unless you have it fixed and even if you have it fixed with the Duke laser disc repair that gives you the greatest strength it's only about 85 to 90 percent of normal strength so once you have an annular tear which is the first thing that happens in all herniations and bulges and you get some of that jelly pushed out it's wedged in the annulus it never goes back to 100 percent strong and it's easy to re-injure it and that's really what happens it's basically throughout life you start playing sports or football you go out and play with your friends you go you know whatever mountain bike riding and that that pressure on the disc puts pushes a little bit more of the jelly out each time and that restarts the inflammatory cascade and, and eventually it just becomes constant pain so I don't mean to you know not demoralize you or anything epidurals are good we do them here but they're not going to be a good long-term solution the best way to fix this problem is to get in with the laser debride the tear get rid of the herniation with the laser let the annulus heal itself okay and our last question all right, well, it was a good um, surgery. I think we covered a lot. You all got to see the annular tear animation and how herniated disc creates inflammation and pain. You got to see the Duke laser disc repair animation. These are on our YouTube channel if you want to watch them. Also, uh, we do have a Duke Spine Institute app. It's free. Uh, you can download onto your iPhone or Android, and it's got a lot of great information. Zach uh, built that app and he's uh, done a, an incredible job. He also did the animations. And Zach is here today, our guest, um, uh, what are you, uh, broadcaster, uh, because Diego's out today. So thank you, Zach, uh, for helping us out. And we have more animations coming. We've got one we're working on this week that's gonna show you how a microdiscectomy is done. And it's gonna go through the steps of the microdiscectomy, and you're gonna be able to see um, Basically, why you don't want a microdiscectomy in the future, you want to get the endoscopic transforaminal laser surgery. So, have a nice day. We just did get one more question. Oh, we just got a question. All right. So, uh, they're asking, uh, what are the three injections you give to a patient after concluding the procedure before withdrawal of working cannula? Yeah, great question. So, um, one of our viewers noticed I do three injections. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a surgeon maybe asking or somebody with very good experience. So the first injection we do is an antiseptic and that is uh, something called betadine. Betadine was developed right here at NASA. Uh, we're literally 10 minutes from NASA. We're located in the space coast of Florida near Orlando. And betadine is just a great universal antiseptic, topical. You don't drink it you don't inject it, you basically just let it go kind of into the surgical wound and then you irrigate it out. So injection number one, betadine, injection number two was saline to remove the betadine, and then injection number three was a little bit of steroid to reduce some of the inflammation that's created by the surgery. Great question, thank you.